Hey, I'm Adam Jesko from ProudMoney.com, and in this video, we are going to look at the best credit cards of 2021 as of the second half of 2021. Did this back in January, a ton has changed. We're redoing it here for the second half of the year. Before we do anything, though, I'm going to ask you to please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you have not already. And if you have already, I thank you for doing so. So back in January, did the best credit cards as of that point and said, if there's a lot of change in the market, we'll do this again mid-year. Well, there's been a ton of change in the market. New cards coming on the market, cards falling off the market, the whole, you know, how COVID was going to play out at that point. We were still a little bit unsure. So a ton has changed. Banks are being super aggressive. So it's like a whole new market almost as of July as I'm making this video. So this is going to be your one-stop shopping video for people that don't necessarily pay a ton of attention to the credit card market and just want to know what is out there, get an overview, a bird's eye view of the whole thing. And with that in mind, we're going to start from the simple end and get into the more sort of complicated end. So what we're going to do is start with cashback credit cards. And what I always start with is what card would I get if I was only going to get one card? If I was someone out there looking for a card, what would be the best thing to jump on on the market? As it stands now, as I make this video, that card, in my opinion, is the well Fargo Active Cash Visa, a card that just recently came out. It is a flat 2% cash back card, meaning you get 2% cash back on everything that you purchase with the card. There are a lot of other 2% cash back cards out there in the market. The reason this one at the moment gets the number one position is because it also has a nice bonus attached to it for new card holders, which oftentimes the other 2% cards do not have. So you could also earn a $200 bonus as a new card holder if you spend a thousand bucks with the card in the first three months. So it's 2% flat cash back and the possibility of a $200 bonus is a nice way to start if you were someone that just wanted to upgrade whatever card you were holding right now. So there are the other 2% cash back cards on the market that you might also look at if you don't like Wells Fargo for whatever reason. There's the City Double Cash Card, PayPal Cashback MasterCard, Fidelity Visa, the SoFi Credit Card, the TD Bank Double Up, and there's some other cards potentially out there on the market as well, but those are sort of the big ones. So Wells Fargo, if you want to take advantage of that bonus, but any of those would be a good foundation for a cash back strategy, or if you just wanted to keep it simple, get the same reward on everything and upgrade from where you were, that'd be a good place to start. Now, if you're willing to carry more than one credit card, well, then you can get some enhanced rewards in certain spending categories, and it's up to you how many cards you might want to choose in order to get different enhanced rewards. If you're willing to carry a lot of cards, you can get yourself 3%, 4%, 5% in a lot of different places. Not everyone wants to do that, so we're going to look at these cards again, sort of from simple to more complicated. So let's say you got that 2% card as a base. Probably the next card I would suggest to you, if you wanted another one, was the City Custom Cash card. Another new card that has debuted in 2021. No annual fee. It's going to give you 5% cash back in one spending category. Wherever you spend the most each billing period, they are going to give you 5% cash back. And that is going to be in certain categories that they have already, already defined, like groceries, restaurants, gas, and there are others as well. So a lot of everyday categories there. Wherever you're gonna spend the most in a month, you'll get 5%. So if you had the City Custom Cash Card and you had the Wells Fargo Active Cash Visa, for example, you get 2% on everything and then you get 5% on that one category where you spent the most money. Now, if you want to take that one step further, you might consider the Capital One Saver One card, a no annual fee card that's going to give you 3% cash back on dining, 3% on groceries, 3% on entertainment purchases, 3% on most streaming services, 1% everywhere else. It's got a bonus opportunity attached to it as well. So right there, you could have three cards where you're going to get 5% in one category, 3% in multiple other categories, 2% in anything that wouldn't fall into those buckets. So that would be a good three card lineup. And then if you wanted to go further, there are so many other good cashback cards on the market where you could home in on one particular spending category and get yourself some enhanced rewards. So I'm going to fly through a whole bunch of different stuff here. The Chase Freedom Flex card, and then I'm also going to talk about the Discover It card here. These are two cards where you can get 5% cash back in a category or categories that these cards define as the 5% cash back categories for each calendar quarter. So every three months, wherever you're going to get 5% is going to change. So you have to kind of keep on top of them and understand where you're getting the 5%. So some of that is going to be in your same sort of everyday categories, groceries, gas, sometimes home improvement, sometimes it'll be uh, Amazon and Walmart.com or whatever. So there's all kinds of different categories where you potentially could get 5% 
every three months they are going to change. That's another way to get yourself 5% cash back, except you can't necessarily count on where you're gonna get that 5% cash back. The US Bank Cash Plus card is a no annual fee card that gives you 5% cash back in two categories, 2% cash back in one category, 1% everywhere else. Those 5% categories and 2% categories are from things where they are gonna give you a list and you choose. So you would choose two 5% categories from things like cell phone service, utilities, uh, furniture stores, TV and internet, all kinds of different stuff there. And some of these are categories that are not necessarily hit by a lot of the other credit cards out there. 2% you are going to choose in one of these sort of everyday categories. So another nice complimentary card to some of these other cards we've talked about. Now, if you tend to shop at certain retailers and they have good rewards credit cards, well, then it might make sense to add those to your wallet as well. Perhaps the most obvious example of a very good card from a major retailer is the Amazon.com Prime Visa. So if you're a paid Amazon Prime customer, it's almost a no-brainer to get this card that's going to give you 5% back on your Amazon purchases. And then you can also get some enhanced rewards in other categories. If you're not a Prime member, you'll still get 3% back at Amazon, which is good, but it makes a little less sense. It's really that Prime customer who's already paying to be part of the program who's definitely going to want to pick up this card. Other cards in this same vein that you might consider, the Walmart credit card, gonna give you 5% back on walmart.com purchases or Walmart app purchases if you get a delivery or pickup from Walmart, give you 2% actually in store at Walmart and some other goodies as well. The Target red card gives you a 5% discount on everything that you buy at Target. So if you are a frequent Target shopper, then obviously it would make sense to get this card or you're paying 5% more than everybody else. If you're a paid member of Costco or Sam's Club, both of those retailers have pretty good credit cards. I think the Sam's Club card is probably a little better if I were a Sam's Club member because it gives you some extra discounts at Sam's Club as well as a good gas rebate. The Costco card, pretty good too, especially on gas as well. Maybe not quite as good as Sam's Club, but if you are a member of either of those, these cards are worth considering. Maybe not as the number one card out of your wallet, but definitely as a complimentary card to some of the others that we've talked about. The Verizon Visa is worth considering if you are a Verizon customer. On the high end, it's giving you 4% on groceries, 4% back on gas, 3% back at restaurants. It's got discounts specific to your Verizon bill, so a lot of good things happening. If there's any catch here, it's that you are not getting cash back in your hands. For the most part, you are gonna use those rewards to offset your Verizon bill. But if you're already paying a Verizon bill, well, then whether you get the 4% as actual cash or you get it toward that Verizon bill, not necessarily a whole lot of difference. So definitely a card worth looking at. And then there are other cards that I could make a case for as well. There are just so many good cashback cards on the market. So some of these might be better for you than some of the ones that I've already talked about. Hard to know in some ways even where to go with so many good ones out there. But also check out Blue Cash Preferred from American Express, the U.S. Bank, Altitude Go Visa, the More Rewards card from Navy Federal Credit Union, if you can qualify as a Navy Federal member, Bank of America Customized Cash Rewards card, the Chase Freedom Unlimited card, which has a 1.5% cash back base, but then also some enhanced rewards. On top of that, you might look at the Venmo Visa to get yourself 3% in a category. You might even look at the Apple card, which is sort of a fringe card as far as I'm concerned, but for some people, very good, especially if maybe your credit score isn't quite as high. All right, so that is cash back. Depending on how many credit cards you are willing to juggle, you could get yourself a pretty good rebate across the board on average across any category that you are spending in. At the very least, if you're not getting 2% cash back on all of your purchases on average, well then you definitely would wanna consider at least getting one of those 2% cards if you have a good enough credit history to qualify, and then maybe getting some other cards even on top of that. Now, we're gonna go into travel next, but first, I wanna talk real quick about bonuses because a lot of the credit card companies have been very aggressive about bonuses here in 2021, especially as the COVID vaccination started rolling out and it seemed clear that there was going to be a lot more freedom to move around the country and do a lot of different things. The credit card companies really ramped up and so there are just some crazy bonuses out there and oftentimes people will dwell on the everyday rewards but not realize that those bonuses could make a huge difference 
difference. So if you have a card that is going to give you a $200 bonus up front for spending 500 bucks or spending $1,000 or something in the first three months, well, 200 bucks is actually kind of a lot in terms of rewards, especially on no annual fee cards. Think of a 2% cash back card. In order to get to $200 in rewards, you'd have to spend $10,000 on that card. So what they're almost saying is, hey, we're going to give you a bonus as if you spent $10,000 on this card. And then you'll also get the rewards on those everyday purchases as well. So make sure you check out those bonuses. Don't only look at what you're going to get in the everyday. So I bring up those bonuses now because as we get into travel, the best travel rewards credit cards, in fact, in my opinion, almost the only travel rewards credit cards worth getting are going to be cards that do have annual fees. But some of them have very big bonuses as well as good everyday rewards. So if you're thinking travel, this is where maybe it gets a little more complicated and you have to think, well, maybe I need to be willing to pay an annual fee. For some people, that's where they're going to cut it off and they're just going to stick with cash back. But if you are willing to think about paying an annual fee, you could get some outsized rewards. And so the card I want to start off with in travel is a card that is okay on an everyday basis. And we'll get into that, but I want to talk about its bonus first. As I make this video, the Chase Sapphire Preferred has a 100,000 point bonus if you can spend at least $4,000 with the card in the first three months of having it. Now, 100,000 points at a minimum, if you cashed out that 100,000 points, that would be worth $1,000. If you used your points in Chase's Ultimate Rewards Travel Portal, you could get $1,250 worth of travel out of that. You could also take your points and transfer them into some of the travel partners that Chase has, including a lot of big names like United and Southwest and Hyatt and Marriott and more, and maybe you could get even more value out of those points. So this card has a $95 annual fee. So that feels bad to pay a $95 annual fee for a card. But if you're going to get a bonus potentially of $1,000 or more on the front end, even if you held the card for three or four years and decided you didn't want it anymore, you still would have come out far ahead. So on an everyday basis, this is only an okay card. You got the $95 annual fee. It's going to give you two points per dollar on your travel and dining purchases of one point per dollar everywhere else. So it's only okay. However, you got the big bonus and this card is sort of a gateway card for Chase because you have to have either the Chase Sapphire Preferred or the Chase Sapphire Reserve in order to access those travel transfer partners or to get a 25% boost on the value of your points through Chase's Ultimate Rewards Travel Portal. So if you want travel rewards, this is a card that a lot of people choose for the really good bonus and the fact that it gives them access to some of the transfer partners and that boost in the portal. Oh, and that's even before I mentioned the fact that you can have other Chase cards that earn points that you could then combine with the points from the Chase Sapphire Preferred and still use them for one of those travel redemptions. So you could get that extra 25% value on points that you earn from other Chase cards that might have enhanced benefits in other categories like the Chase Freedom Flex or the Chase Freedom Unlimited that I mentioned earlier. Now, a big part of the reason that I let off talking about travel credit cards with the Chase Sapphire Preferred is because that's a card that is relatively inexpensive to sort of get into the travel game if you want travel rewards. Otherwise, a lot of travel credit cards are going to have kind of hefty annual fees. They're going to be kind of expensive and they're not necessarily going to make sense if you're not someone that doesn't put a good amount of charges on your credit cards or someone that doesn't travel very often. So a lot of these cards are going to make the most sense for people that are already traveling or already putting a lot of points on their card or putting a lot of dollars on their cards and want to get rewards. If you're not spending a whole lot, it doesn't make sense to pay an annual fee for a travel credit card. All right, so I need to break down the travel category a little further here. If you're interested in travel rewards, there's sort of two ways to go. You could go with a specific airline or hotel chain, or maybe you would want to go with flexible rewards from Chase American Express or another company. So if you wanted to do a specific airline, a specific hotel, what you're getting there is more rewards and perks from that airline or hotel, but you're getting less flexibility in terms of how you can use your miles or use your points. So there are good cards from Delta and Southwest and United and Marriott and Hilton and Hyatt. Pretty much all the airlines and hotel chains are going to have some good credit cards if you are someone that either already stays at those hotels or flies those airlines or again if you're going to put a lot of charges on your card preferably both because then it would make sense it would you know get you status perhaps on the airlines get you free breakfasts and free upgrades at the hotels all those good things 
On the other hand are the cards that give you flexible rewards. So cards that give you flexible points are obviously going to give you a lot more flexibility. You can use them across airlines, you could use them across hotel chains, you could use them in a travel portal to put together a whole itinerary and pay for it with points. The two big dogs in the travel world with flexible points, Chase and American Express. I already talked about the Chase Sapphire Preferred. There's also the Chase Sapphire Reserve, the higher end card with, as I make this video, $550 annual fee, but a lot going on that maybe you could use to justify that annual fee. $300 travel credit, you are going to get access to airport lounges, three points per dollar on travel and dining purchases. You are going to have a 50% boost on the value of your points if you use them through Chase's Ultimate Rewards Travel Portal to book your travel. And then, like I said earlier, you can pool points from other Chase cards into the Chase Sapphire Reserve account, and then you would get that 50% boost on those travel rewards from the other points that you'd earned on all other Chase Chase cards as well. So a lot of people really like that facet of this card as well as the Chase Sapphire Preferred. So overall, when I look at the Chase cards, they are in my mind probably the way to go if you're someone that hasn't done a whole lot in terms of earning travel points in the past because they are pretty flexible and they're maybe a little more forgiving in the fact that if you decide that you don't want to use them toward travel, Chase will still let you cash out at a penny per point. So you always have that as a backup, which is pretty nice and is in contrast to American Express. The American Express Membership Rewards Program can be very good if you are sure that you want travel rewards because it doesn't have a great fallback position if you change your mind. If you decide to cash out your American Express points for the most part, you're going to get a lousy redemption rate, especially in comparison to what Chase is giving you. But if you know you want to travel, many people prefer American Express because they have maybe more international airline partners in particular. So if you're someone that wants to travel internationally or you're willing to to, you know, give a little more in terms of points for a business class seat or a first class seat or maybe a hotel that you would normally never pay for out of pocket, but if you had enough points, you would be willing to do it. A lot of people feel that American Express is better for this, even though Chase has good travel transfer partners as well. So. If you're the type of person that, number one, wants to travel internationally and you want to do the work to figure out where those sweet spots are, where you can really get a lot of value out of your points, American Express is often the choice for those types of people. So in my mind, on the consumer side, there are only two cards worth considering from American Express with the Membership Rewards Program. That's the Amex Platinum and the Amex Gold. Amex Platinum just increased their annual fee to $695, which is going to make it very hard to justify for most people. Yes, you're going to get some nice rewards. You're going to get a big bonus on the front end, and there are some decent credits that you might get from this card. But for a lot of people, it's going to be very hard to justify all of these things being worth a $695 dollar annual fee. And perhaps that is the point because some people like to have this card because it feels prestigious to have the American Express Platinum card shows maybe that you're a high roller and you can afford to pay that much for a card whether you're getting full value out of that or not. So you do have some good things with this card. You get access to maybe the best airport lounge network. You're getting five points per dollar on your airline purchases and hotel purchases when you book through Amex Travel. So if you're someone that does travel a lot, does spend a lot on your credit cards, this card can make sense. But for a lot of people, it's going to be hard to justify. The American Express Gold, perhaps easier to justify with its $250 annual fee, especially if you're someone that spends a lot on your cards, but not necessarily on travel, because it gives you four points per dollar on dining, 4% on groceries. You have some other enhanced earning categories as well. And then you have an up to $120 Uber credit and up to $120 dining credit for delivery services in particular, but also some other restaurant chains in there and some other good stuff happening with this card as well. Again, you want to be using this card a lot in order to sort of maximize the points you earn. The credits that they give you sound nice on the surface, but you have to make sure you can use them because American Express likes to chop up its credits by month. So when I say up to $120, what that really means is you're getting $10 per month. And if you don't use it in that month, well, then you are going to lose it. It's not going to carry over. So unless you know you're going to use these 
credits every month, they may not be worth as much as American Express would like you to think they are. So I think Chase is the easier program to understand, the easier program to get redemptions that you want, the easier program to sort of justify to yourself when you're looking at the annual fees and what you get in return. American Express, more complicated. Some people like more complicated because there are fewer people sort of competing for the travel redemptions that they want. So if you're someone willing to do the work, again, American Express can make a lot of sense. But if that's not you, you're just getting into travel rewards, Chase is probably the place to start, at least on the flexible reward front. Now, that's not to say those are the only travel cards. You might look at the Capital One Venture Rewards card. Capital One has upped its travel game in terms of travel transfer partners and the transfer rates you can get with those partners. That is worth looking at. The U.S. Bank Altitude Reserve, a pretty good high-end travel card with not quite as high of an annual fee as some of these other cards that we have talked about. If you're a member of Navy Federal Credit Union or could be, their flagship rewards card is nice and simple. Three points per dollar on travel, two points per dollar every where else with a $49 annual fee and some other things going on with that card as well. Some people really swear by it. Now, Citibank in the past has had the City Prestige card. As I make this video, that has been pulled from the market. I don't know if City is coming up with a new high-end card. If you are watching this video a few months down the road, perhaps there is a new Citibank card out there as well, so make sure you check their website. All right, so we spent a lot of time on cashback and travel credit cards, but I do want to talk about some other categories that might be of interest depending on who you are. We're going to kind of fly through these and only name maybe one or two cards in a lot of instances. Let's start with business cards. I think the best ones are probably going to be from Chase or American Express. On the Chase end, you have the Chase Inc. Business Preferred card or the Chase Inc. Business Cash card to look at. On the American Express end, you have the American Express Blue Business Cash card, which is a cashback card, or the American Express press blue business plus card which is in the american express membership rewards program and then I want to briefly talk about some consumer cards for people that are new to credit or maybe have had some past credit problems and have a little lower credit score. If you are new to credit and you are a college student, the Bank of America Customized Cash Reward Card is the one that I would choose for you. No annual fee and you have some nice cash back rewards there. If you are new to credit but not a college student, perhaps you are new to credit overall or you are new to the country and you're new to credit in the U.S., there are a number of cards. You might start looking at Capital One with the Quicksilver card or discover with the it card these cards oftentimes are going to be more lenient to people that are newer to credit especially if you have some decent income I would say if you're over twenty thousand dollars per year in income these are cards that are going to look a little more favorably upon you you might also look at the pedal credit card the Jasper master card is good especially if you are new to the country the Apple card oftentimes is going to be open to people that don't have a credit history or they might have a path to get you approved. They have sort of a program for that. So those are all cards that are worth looking at. Now, if you are not new to credit, but your credit score is too low to qualify for some of those cards we talked about earlier, and you're trying to sort of get back into the game, probably the ladder to go down or the ladder to go up is to start with trying to see if you can pre-qualify for a Capital One or Discover card. So if you can get your hands on the Quicksilver from Capital One or the Discover It card, maybe the Capital One Platinum card. If you can't qualify for one of those, use their pre-qualification tools on their websites and see if you qualify. If you do, great, that's a good place to start. The Apple card also, like I said, has sort of a path to approval. So even if they might not approve you initially, they might sort of give you an option to do some things that would get you approved down the road. You'd have to do a little more investigation there. Now, if you can't get approved at any of those places, or any of the other places we've talked about in this video, I would say don't go to things like Credit One or First Premier or those cards that are going to charge you a lot and give you a very tiny credit line. Instead, that's the time to go for a secured credit card, which does force you to put a security deposit down in order to get the credit card. But it can be good because it can give you a foothold in with some of the bigger credit card companies. So Bank of America has a good secured card. Discover has a good secured card that oftentimes will graduate to the regular Discover It card over a fairly short period of time. The Chime Credit Builder card has been popular, a card where you have a Chime savings account or deposit account, and then the secured card is basically based off of what you have in your deposit account. So some people like that as well. So I would say go for the secured route before you go for a card that is you know, unsecured. You don't have to put a deposit down, but your credit line is so small and the fees are so high that you end up miserable.
So that is it, kind of a lot to digest there. This was sort of a one-stop shopping video. We have a lot of other videos for all these specific topics all throughout the year. So if you turn into a credit card junkie or you already are one, I would hope you would subscribe and we can talk about the minutia of all these cards in other videos. But this is sort of the bird's eye view of the industry at this point here in the second half of 2021. Hopefully, if you are just a casual credit card user and you're not all that into it, this will have been helpful to you. And even if you watch every single video that we make, I hope it will be helpful to you as well. Questions, comments, put them in that comment section below. Otherwise, I thank you for watching. And as always, please go to ProudMoney.com where we do credit card reviews and we talk personal finance and we talk deals and all sorts of other fun stuff too. Thanks for watching, bye.